for a call for moral revival it's come up with a series of demands i know that you are here for the same reason we all are here to put our beneficial all notice the pain and the discontent is real and the demands of our movement are moral we know what we want to focus on our agenda is clear we demand an immediate implementation of federal and state living wage laws. We demand the right for all workers to form and join unions. We demand equal pay for equal work. We demand a guaranteed annual income. We demand fully funded anti-poverty programs that protects the welfare of us all. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state. We want single payer university health care not for some, but for everybody. of the Foreign Human Rights Act. We demand an end to racist gerrymandering. We want early registration of 17 and 18 year olds. We want registration to vote at age 18. If we can be drafted for war at 18, we ought to be able to vote automatically at 18. Early voting in every state, same day registration, and the enactment of election day as a holiday. We demand a reversal of state laws that prevent municipalities from raising minimum wage. We demand an end to mass incarceration and the continuing inequalities of black, brown, and poor white people with a criminal justice system. We demand the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated. A clear and just immigration system. This includes providing a timely citizenship process that guarantees the right to vote. The First Nation, Native American, and Alaskan Native people retain their tribal recognition as a nation, not a race. We demand decent housing. We demand relief from crushing household food and consumer debt. Equity in education. We demand an end to the resegregation of schools. We demand free tuition at public colleges and universities and an end to profiteering on student debt. Equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law. And we demand that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We demand a stop to privatization of military budget and any increase in military spending. We demand a ban on assault rifles and a ban on the easy access of firearms. We demand an end to federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. We demand that the call to build a wall at the U.S. Mexico border be ceased. We demand a ban on fracking, mountaintop removal, coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines, refineries, and coal, oil, and gas export terminals. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. Somebody's hurting my brother, somebody's hurting our sisters, and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. We believe that we can win. We believe that we can win. We believe that everybody, everybody has a right, has a right to live, to live, to live.
Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this very important conversation on the people's health in crisis, reflections on poverty, racism, and the fight to defend democracy with Reverend Dr. William Joseph Barber II and Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. On March 14th, less than one week after the COVID-19 pandemic was declared a national emergency, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, began to sound the alarm about the devastating impact we are wit now witnessing. They recognized then that the emergency resulted from a deeper and much, lo much longer term crisis, that of poverty and inequality, and that of a society that ignores the needs of the 141 million people who are poor and low income in this country. Over the course of the last seven months, the campaign has engaged in scathing critique of the failures of those in power, rallied thousands around the country across lines of division, and offered a transformative policy platform for a radically new way forward. Today's conversation, sponsored by the Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights and the UCLA Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health, is designed to offer insights into the current moment from a movement that has engaged in intensive, deeply political, nonpartisan organizing that is building power among the poor and dispossessed all across this country. By focusing on the interlocking injustices of systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, and militarism, by challenging the false narrative of extreme religious nationalism, and working alongside directly impacted leaders, this movement offers an antidote to the times in which we live. Now I'll turn um, to Dr. Mary Bassett, Director of the Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights for additional opening remarks. Again, welcome. Thank you for those inspiring words, Dr. Barber, and, and especially for inviting me and the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights uh, to be part of the Poor People's Campaign's Health Justice Advisory Committee that has focused on COVID-19 since March. I'd also like to thank the UCLA Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health and its director, Dr. Chandra Ford, for co-sponsoring this important conversation. Over the past months, it's become abundantly clear that the United States, one of the wealthiest, most medically advanced countries in the world, has tragically failed to respond to the biggest public health threat of our time. But this was never a failure of health professionals. It was and continues to be a political failure, a governance failure, a failure to act. With over 225,000 Americans who've lost their lives to COVID, with a number of new infections rising each day and breaking new records, and with the deep injustice revealed in the disproportionate impact on communities of color, where Black, Latin, Latinx, and indigenous communities face a mortality rate that's threefold higher than among white Americans. Well, with all this, it can be hard not to despair. But today's conversation is one of hope. Less than a week before final voting in the United States election, we are honored to have the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend Dr. William Barber and Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, join us to talk about the people's health in crisis, the fight that we must join to defend democracy and end poverty and combat structural racism. When I joined FXB, I really hoped to have Reverend Barber come speak and we never imagined then the circumstances that we would be facing now. It is inconceivable that the COVID-19 death toll would be as high as it is today if the current administration just believed in science. And as the editors of the New England Journal, all of them have clearly noted, and this is our most prestigious medical journal, our current political leaders have demonstrated that they are dangerously incompetent and they must be voted out. It's also worthwhile reflecting on whether we as public health and medical communities with our commitment to expertise, to neutrality, whether we could have done better. 
whether by historically staying in our lane and refusing to become passionately involved in politics and political advocacy, did we unwittingly help pave an open highway for COVID-19? So today is our opportunity to commit to doing better, to learn from leaders in movement building, and we will speak about poverty, about affordable housing, precarious jobs, about low wages, mass incarceration. We will talk about racism because this is public health. These are the root causes of COVID-19 and other health inequities. As a former health commissioner of New York City, my hope is that this moment of which today's conversation will be an example with some outstanding epidemiologists participating, that this moment will endure and transform how scientists engage and participate in political life. It's not enough to simply vote for new leadership. Whoever wins this election, we must commit to using our expertise to bolster movements, movements like the Poor People's Campaign, because it is these movements that will save lives. So we have a great program today. Dr. Zinzi Bailey, Research Assistant Professor at the University of Miami J. Weiss Institute for Health Equity is going to be leading the conversation with Reverend Barber and Reverend Thea Harris. Then we're gonna take your questions. You can add your questions as we go along using the Q&A function in Zoom or the comment function in Facebook. And we have a lot to talk about. So let's get started, Dr. Bailey. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Bassett. Um, so thank you guys for joining us and tuning in. I wanna get right into this kind of discussion. Um, I wanna introduce our two distinguished guests um, ahead of time. Um, I'm gonna shorten their bios, but you can check them out um, on uh, the event page um, and check out all of the bios, right? Um, but um, we're here to see um, and listen to Reverend Dr. Barber and Reverend Dr. Theo Harris. Um, so, uh, Dr. Reverend, the, doc, the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, bishop with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, visiting professor, at the Union Theological Seminar, Seminary, pastor of the Greenleaf Christian Church, um, uh, Disciples of Christ in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and the author of four books. <laughs> so that already is quite a bit, right? Um, check out more on the event page. Um, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris is a co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and serves as director of the Caro Center and founder, founder coordinator of the Poverty Initiative. She has spent the past two decades organizing amongst the poor in the United States, working with and advising grassroots organizations with significant victories, including the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, the Vermont Workers Center, Domestic Workers United, the United Workers Association, the National Union of the Homeless and the Kensington Welfare Rights Union. So with all of that, I wanna get us started with one key question, right? So um, we're less than a week away from one of the most consequential elections of our generation. Um, uh, Reverend Barber, uh, you have described this election as being a matter of life and death, not only because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the reckless disregard for life of this current administration, but also what's at stake with regard to the health of this democracy. Can you provide us with some context um, of the current attacks of demo on democracy and why that's important? It's so important to be engaged during this election cycle? Well, I can. Thank you so much. And let me um, thank, of course, Reverend. Dr. Liz, our co-chair, for joining me, and thank uh, Dr. Bassett, uh, Dr. Barber, and Dr. Ford for their great uh, advisory uh, to the PPC campaign because we wanted to be out front <clears throat> on these issues. Um, we knew that going into them, the one group that would be uh, left off if we didn't fight would be the poor. 
poor and low wealth people. Now, um, I want to say that we're in the middle of this election because a lot of people are voting already. And one thing that we cannot have or we cannot just think about, I think we have to think about this election. It cannot be an election to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. uh, normal was killing us. <laughs> uh, I just got off the phone with Ty, Ty, our brother Coates, Tanisha Coates, and he, we were talking about this, this very issue. Um, one of the things that um, I've been reading today is Isaiah 10, verses 1 to 3, being a preacher. It's an ancient text honored by uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jewish people. And it simply says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And you know, prey is something you kill, something you devour. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was at the um, National Cathedral <clears throat> and actually was, um, it was not a few weeks ago, actually it was in um, June and June 14th, I believe. And I preached a sermon entitled, America Must Decide That Death Is Not An Option Anymore. The argument was that in the real sense, the battle of our democracy has been the battle for life and death. And I could trace it, I won't do it now, how public policy is really about who lives and who dies a real sense that we've always faced the challenge of addressing necropolitics, the politics of who lives and who dies. And all policies to some degree has what I call a DM on the DL, a death measurement on the down low. Now we talk about death when we see police violence and killing because, well, we talk about it if somebody gets it on camera and then it becomes a big issue. <clears throat> uh, uh, but the reality is that there are policies, and while that's horrendous and horrific and horrible and we ought to deal with police violence, even in terms of racism, we cannot limit our conversation to racism just to police brutality and killing, nor can we limit our focus at what's killing black folk to just police killings. That's a form of necropolitics, not the only form. Um, and we have to be very careful. Furthermore, uh, when it comes to life in general, we uh, have a lot of, uh, of death measurements. So let's just take a look. Before COVID, I think we have to start And One of the things, Dr. Bass, that I'm so concerned about is people that act like things got bad when COVID happened. Now things got worse when COVID happened. <laughs> but and things are going to get, get catastrophically worse. Uh, we just did a study with the Economic Policy Institute that what's going to happen if we don't have a real serious change uh, in the first few days of the new um, uh, administration, hopefully. But things were already bad. People were already in depression. Poor people. There were 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country prior to COVID. 43% of this nation, 66 million white people, 26 million black people. That's 61% of black people and 30% of white people prior to COVID, 68% of Latinos, 68% of indigenous people. But here's the other piece of that that we don't often talk about. 700 people were dying a day from poverty before COVID. Now think about that. Seven people die from 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 um, what's that smoking that they were doing the um, vaping uh, from vaping seven people died from vaping and we had a White House briefing congressional action prior to COVID seven hundred people were dying a day from poverty and no action so it's 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 almost hypocritical to some degree for some people to be so upset about a thousand people dying a day from COVID when what we should have already had our conscience seared because 700 people were dying a day from poverty. Didn't have to be. 
uh, before COVID, 87 million people were uninsured or underinsured. And I think some years ago, uh, up at Harvard, I don't know about UCLA, Dr. Ford, but there was a study done of how many people die for every thousand, every one million people who are not insured. I mean, there's a DM on the DL in every piece of public policy. Uh, before COVID, there were 4 million people get up every morning could buy unleaded gas, can't buy unleaded water. If you trace that all the way down, you can trace that down to a death measurement. We spend 800, we were spending $800 billion a year on war economy. If you trace that down and look at the money we put into war, 54 cents of every discretionary dollar, less than 16 cents of every discretionary dollar goes to living wages, healthcare, infrastructure, and environment. There again, you find a DM on the death because somebody's dying because we're putting more in the war economy than we are into protecting people in, the, in their communities. And then lastly, when you look at the death measurement of what's happening on reservations and among our indigenous people, we had children and families dying in modern day concentration camps. And now we find that we lost 500 children and that's probably a minimum death. Now, even some, even some like voter suppression causes death. What do you mean? Well, every state that's a voter suppression state is also a high poverty state, is mm -hmm. a low insurance coverage state, is a is a is a low wage state. It's even a state that that gives more power to the polluters to pollute people's communities and therefore cause death. So my point is, elections are not about personality; they are about public policy. And the public policy that we've got to address in this election is really about life and death because we literally, lastly, have people running for office that are so bold that they will stand up in your face and tell you, if you elect me, I'm going to take your health care, knowing that folks are going to die for that. If you elect me, I'm going to deny COVID and deny the science, knowing that people are going to die. If you elect me, I'm not going to increase the living wage. So that means 49 million people work every day and, and live in poverty. And 49 million people could be lifted out of poverty if we just raise the living wage to $15 an hour. Elect me, and I'm going to deregulate the polluters even more. What they are basically saying is, elect me, and I'll kill you. I mean, we have to become more graphic in how we are hearing what people are saying, and they're running for office. So in a real sense, this election is about life and death, and even the life and death of this democracy, because what we are witnessing is the gangsterization of our politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you see what has happened, and I close here, you think about this. 50 some men, 52 men, well, maybe one woman, in the United States Senate decided that it was more important to put one woman on the court for life than protect thousands from being put in caskets forever. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a moment. One woman on court for court for life out of pure political lust for power and political greed, rather than pass a stimulus pack that would protect thousands from being put in caskets for ever. It is political murder. Now, King called it the same in 68. We must call it the same today. This election is about life and death. And it's not about going back to normal. It's about trying to stop what's happening now and then pushing the new holders of the office to do more to save life. Thank you so much. Those are really powerful words. Um, um, and stemming from that, I know that you guys have been doing quite a bit um, throughout this election cycle. So uh, Rever Reverend Liz, can you tell us a more about more uh, mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating um, a movement that votes? Um, all those efforts um, and what it has been able to accomplish over the last few months? Well, thanks so much uh, for that question. And again, for, for putting this whole program together, it's really an honor to be here uh, with, with 
uh, amazing leaders that are making a difference in this in this world. Um, so as Reverend Barber was saying, right, uh, this this election is about life and death, and and poor and low income people, the 140 million people who were poor or one fire, one storm, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, away from deep poverty um, before COVID-19 hit. Um, uh, are coming forward and saying that we, it's in the power of our hands, we must do more. And that means uh, organizing phone banks and text banks. We will have reached out to more than 2 million poor and low-income people, uh, especially in, in key states, um, you know, southern states, states where um, the, the margin of victory um, is small enough that when poor and low-income people come out uh, and vote, um, around an agenda, an agenda that says no to racism, an agenda that says no to health care cuts, um, yes to health care expansion, yes to living wages, yes to environmental protections that are about saving our communities and the earth, um, yes to social welfare programs, um, because what we know is that when we lift from the bottom, that everybody rises. Um, and so we're, we're texting and phone banking, you know, we're doing that bilingually, uh, multilingually, we're doing that in ASL, amongst deaf and hard of hearing, we're doing that amongst people of every race, creed, color, um, uh, and, and geography um, across this country. Um, and, and then we're also coming forward, you know, raising, sounding the alarm um, about the importance of this election and the importance of people being organized and mobilized um, to both flip this election and to keep organizing for power, building up power. Uh, you know, we released a study uh, this summer, a study that is really groundbreaking. It, it, it shows that when poor and low-income people vote at the same margins that higher-income people vote, uh, the margin of victory um, uh, for um, candidates that stand for health care, candidates that stand for living wages, um, it is overcome just by poor and low income people, uh, a small uptick of, of, of folks voting. And so, so we've had leaders all across the country in the 45 states that we're organizing. You know, what we found is that 15 states, um, uh, if poor and low-income people had been voting um, more in the 2016 election in 15 states, uh, th there would have been a different outcome. We would not have Donald Trump in the presidency. Um, poor people did not give us Donald Trump, um, uh, and and poor people are not going to give us Donald Trump again. Um, and and so that and in 2018 in the midterms, um, there were 16 states where the margin of victory. Um, was somewhere between one and 19% of poor and low income voters coming together, voting around an agenda, you know, have the power to shift the entire political landscape. And so, so that's exactly what the Moore campaign is about. We've been holding Senate town halls, having poor and low income people pose questions, not gotcha questions, but where do, where do candidates stand on the issues that are impacting people's lives, livelihoods, and health. And, um, and again, millions of people are, are, are being reached out to and, and hundreds of thousands of folks have been taking action together. And, uh, you know, we're already seeing the impact. I mean, the fact that, that 50 more than 51% people that voted totally in the 2016 election have already voted, and we still have almost a week to go. We got to keep it going. But, but, you know, clearly um, we, see, um, we see people from, from uh, Kentucky to Arkansas to Mississippi to North Carolina to South Carolina to Michigan to Maine all um, uh, organizing across all of these lines that are, have been historically dividing us, but, but building um, a power, uh, a power that can make the power structures in the words of Dr. King say yes um, when they may be desirous of saying no. Thank you so much. Um, those are inspiring words as well. Um, and it brings me to kind of a self-reflection, which is, you know, during the last few decades, we could say, um, many of us health professionals have been coming to terms with the fact that in order to have sustained health equity, um, there's a need for fundamental change. Um, the fundamental change in our policies and institutions that have upheld 
structural racism, structural poverty, going on and on and on, right? Um, so the Poor People's Campaign has been, um, has been clear that electoral politics is only one tactic in the arsenal of strategies to usher in what has been described as the third reconstruction. Uh, the moment requires a movement um, if we're going to have this kind of fundamental change, right? So since December 2017, you all have organized a powerful new and unsettling force against systemic racism and systemic poverty um, that unites the poor across lines that have been used to divide us. Um, Reverend Liz, can you tell us about the origins of the Poor People's Campaign and the work that has gone into reviving the movement that Dr. King envisioned over 50 years ago? And actually, what lessons actually, have you learned? Yeah, actually, I was supposed to take that first question. You'll take that one? Sure. Yeah, I, have to, I have to step off and, and we knew that was gonna happen today. Um, part of what I think, you just, you just said something though about third reconstruction. Now people are talking about reckoning. But we like to use the word reconstruction because we say it's more than just get, getting back at somebody. Uh, and reconstruction suggests that you not only change policy, but the face of those who make the policy. And one of the things in the Poor People's Campaign is in, in this iteration of it, and by the way, it wasn't just Dr. King. That's one of the misnomers too. It was Dr. King, but it really was pushed by the welfare rights women. Uh, it was also the Jewish Federation, it was Cesar Chavez, it was Latino. I think it's so important, Liz and I always talking about this, to make sure that we don't isolate it. Um, uh, Dr. King at that time, when he came to the Poor People's Campaign concept, you know, was reading the book, The Two Americas. Uh, people forget that when he did this speech at Riverside, he'd been invited there by a group that was anti-war, but when he decided to say that poverty, racism, and war were triumph evils. Um, what many people, and he, and he connected them as interlocking injustices and suggested that they had, it, had to be addressed uh, simultaneously uh, and not in silos. Um, 150 newspapers wrote against them the next morning. Civil rights organizations, prominent civil rights organizations wrote resolutions against the stands. Uh, churches backed away from them. Uh, I mean, it was not an easy path to take, but but what he was trying to show us and what we continue to pick up, not only from him, but reaching all the way back to the Reconstruction Movement of the 1800s, when black and white and poor white folk came together after the Civil War to say, we need to be united together around some common agendas. There are these interlocking agendas that are hurting us. Uh, so they, the, the black and poor black folk freed and former slave and poor white folk all over the South came together and changed the South. Of course, they were under the cover of, 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 of the military because if they had not been, the former planners would have just killed them. But they worked together <clears throat> for public education. They worked together for better wages and criminal justice fairness. They, they even worked together for health care. You know, we talk about right now in this moment where people want to take away health care. Well, this is not new. You know, mm -hmm. the, the time that we have seen the worst uh, a, a goal to take away health care uh, that's already in place was when the uh, former planters and former slave owners uh, took over the uh, government again, uh, cut taxes, and, and in 1868, I believe it was, they ended the Freedmen Bureau hospitals that were mm -hmm. actually giving health care to black and poor white folk, right? So some of this stuff is not new, for lack of a better word, it's regurgitated evil. Uh, and I mm -hmm. could call it something else, but I won't since I'm on this. <laughs> but, but the reconstruction is not just about a change in policy, it's about a change in, in the narrative. It's about a change mm -hmm. in the person, the people who make the policies. And one of the things that we're saying, and the, this, the lesson we are clear on the Poor People's Campaign is that systemic racism, and by that we mean all forms of racism, not just how to black people, brown people, indigenous people, systemic poverty, uh, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism must be seen as interlocking. In other words, that while we work in our silos, there must be a campaign 
that refuses to go into silos but see how all of these things are connected. In other words, you can't be concerned about changes in healthcare policy and not also be on the front line of addressing voter suppression. I mean, you just can't because the po you, you can't because if you don't address that, for instance, you can't even really be concerned about changing healthcare in this country and not be specifically also engaged in the fight to stop racist voter suppression in the South. Because the south, southern states are not red states. They are unorganized, low voting states. They are the states that Dr. King said in 1965, standing on the steps of the Alabama State House, that every time there is an attempt by poor and low wealth people to come together and build power and build a beloved community, the bourbon class, the aristocracy, the greedy, the wealthy, deliberately sow division between black and white folk to keep them from building a political power base. And so if you know that history, then you understand that, that, this, that the plan of locking up the South from, from Maryland to, to New Mexico and, and holding hostage of 193 electoral college votes and, and, mm -hmm. and plus 30 members of the United States House, I mean, the United States Senate is all by design. It's an illusion. But it's an illusion that has, has great power and has been used to deliberately keep poor folk and people who would vote for health care and living wages divided by race, right? And to keep them under participating. And so our campaigns, the poor people's campaign says, wait a minute, what if we organize the very people that people don't want to see organized? <laughs> what, and what if we do it from the bottom up? And what if we put everybody in the same room? And what if we organize around these interlocking injustices? And what if we can put together, you know, white women from West Virginia and black women from, from Alabama? And what if we can change the narrative and put a new face on poverty and show that poverty is not just somebody on the street homeless, which is critical, and critical but, but poverty is also people walking around every day, $400 away from a, a major emergency. Poverty is the fact that in no county in America can a person working a minimum wage job afford a basic two bedroom apartment. And what if we show people how this is all connected? And so what we, and what if we build from the bottom up? And we have this piece called 14 Steps, I don't have it, won't delineate it today, principles of organizing. But what if we use moral language and not this language of left versus right and Democrat uh, and, and um, liberal versus conservative, you know, and, and, and what is happening is we now have 43 state coordinating committees, you know, thousands of people connected, uh, uh, the reach of over, you know, when we had our mass poor people's assembly moral march on Washington, a digital fad that we had planned to have in person, but because of COVID and the advice of Dr. Ford and, and Dr. Bassett and Dr. Barber, we didn't have it but we did still get 2.7, almost 3 million people to show up online. And it's showing that there is a hunger to address these issues of poverty, which as I said, was 43% before COVID, over 50% and headed higher uh, uh, since COVID. But the point of the poor, and notice lastly, poor people's campaign, national call for moral revival. It's long, but every word is important. Number one, poor people, people said to us, don't call it poor people because poor people are offended by being called poor. So we asked poor people and they said, hell no, we're not offended by being called poor. We are poor. We're glad somebody's finally talking about us. What we're offended by is a nation that will let this many people be poor. Don't take, don't take that from us. Don't, don't allow us to speak our truth. Don't, don't make it so we have to come up with some pseudonym, some nip like uh, uh, people trying to make it in the middle class. No, we're poor and low wealth. Then second, a campaign, not a moment, not a rally, not a campaign, something that's going to keep building and keep growing. And then national in scope, we nationalize state movement. And then revival, what kind of revival? A moral revival, what do we mean? Taking the principles of our constitution, our deepest religious values, and using them as a grid to analyze public policy, to do moral analysis, engage in moral action, and uh, more, excuse me, moral analysis, moral articulation, and moral action, uh, which concludes everything, even up to civil disobedience if necessary, but it's believing in the agency of poor and low wealth people mm -hmm. so that they are not pushed to the side 
they are right in the centerpiece, not doing for people, but doing with them. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have one more question for Dr. Liz, and then we're going to open it out to um, the broader audience. So please just drop those questions in. Um, and so, uh, Reverend Liz, um, how can scholars, public health professionals, and practitioners engage with this work? Um, what is our role to play in this larger movement? So Reverend Barber has a, uh, has a saying that ha we've made uh, a part of this campaign, which is that we don't want to be loud. Um, and we know that we're pretty good at being loud, right? We, we pulled off the largest, most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience. You know, we had 3 million people online for a, a mass um, uh, Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. We don't want to be loud and wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> that, that this work is based on deep empirical research and analysis. Um, you know, we we have to embrace and use all of the tools that are at our disposal um, because it's going to take a lot of knowledge. It's going to take a lot of research. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going like, to take a lot of policy. It's going to take a lot of organizing and mobilizing to be able to to really transform the society. Um, from the bottom up. And so, you know, we have been deeply indebted to this uh, a group of public health um, officials and epidemiologists and, and scholars and researchers um, for advising us about, you know, how we continue to organize the kind of information we should be sharing. Um, and so we need folk to, to do what you're doing and do it in service of a movement. Um, and and the movement needs everybody. We need all those skills. We need all hands on deck. Um, and we are going to, we, we have to be right. Um, we have to be not just correct, um, but we have to be able to be right and effective and, and build up. And so, you know, we, we look forward to continued partnership with you all. Um, and, and we need people to come forward with, with everything that you have and that you know, because this movement needs it. Um, you know, for folks, you know, living with raw sewage in their yards to folks, you know, being separated at cages at the border. We, we, need, we need scholarship and we need engaged scholarship, um, uh, which is exactly what you all um, are, are showing uh, the way on. Thank you so much. And Liz, when we do civil disobedience, we want some scholars to go to jail with us. And then when yep. you, come out, you can say you got your marks and you can, you're in the movement too. So we had a whole group in Ball Monday of scholars that deliberately went to jail when we went and then came out and also did that footnotes. Uh, because that, that has a certain, that sends an alarm of how bad it is. See, when, when mm -hmm. scholars step out of the academy and say, not only am I going to do my academy work, but I'm going to stand with the people it gives you a different credibility with the people, but it also sends something must be mighty wrong. Something must be mighty wrong if a Dr. Ford is in the line with Ford. I mean, it really must be bad. You know, and I'm serious about that. It really must be bad when the scholars are saying, we've done all we can, we've pitched all the facts we can, but now we have to really do something to sear and shake the consciousness and foundation of the country. Excellent. So we have a question in the chat. So this person said, I fully appreciate Reverend Barber's plea to use more graphic language to describe the political murder going um, uh, on, murder going on every day. There we go. I'm interested in how you understand and explain the 30 to 40% of the population that identify as Trump supporters, right or wrong. Um, they know that he puts children in cages and don't care. Um, that base is instrumental to electing right-wing officials in many states and in rural and small towns, even in blue states. How do we reach them? Well, I don't know. I'm wrestling with why. I mean, I wrestle with how can you know, certain Black men say that they support uh, 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 the policies of Trumpism. But I will say you know, that, you know, America has a, has a strange, strange, strange history. Uh, 
if we had voted on, if we had put the Voting Rights Act to a popular vote, it probably wouldn't have passed. Civil Rights Act to a vote, it probably wouldn't have passed. Slavery probably wouldn't have passed. I mean, the lies and mythology that uh, grow out of this, history, this country's struggle with race and class are potent. Uh, you know, when you weave in, uh, when you brew up the l lust for power and greed, and then the commitment that other folk are less than, and you mix that all up together, that is a witch's brew, if you will, uh, or warlock's brew of, of political poison. I mean, going all the way back to slavery itself, it wasn't just, you know, you know as, as even Kendi has taught us, race was a created category. Mm -hmm. It was designed, you know, when after Bacon's Rebellion, how can we set, make sure these black and white folk don't organize again against the bad labor? What can we do? Oh, I know what we'll do. We'll come up with a category of race. You know, he reminds us that a lot of the, the racism uh, was, uh, as we talk about racism outward, people first made a decision about policy. And so when you take, for instance, the issue of what the underpinnings of slavery, I, I say there are five things. First one is um, evil economics. And that is the end justifies the means. And then the next one is bad biology. And that is that brain size can be determined by uh, your skin color. The next is sick sociology, that people can be around each other, but there has to be a hierarchy. The next one is po political pathology, where the politics is more about not fulfilling the, the, what is said in writing, all persons and men are created equal, and more committed to saying only some people, even though you say one thing on writing. But then you also have that last piece, heretical ontology, and that is that God intended it this way. I mean, I think that my, the person asking the call, you have to understand that this 30% you talk about today, uh, this uh, keep supporting Trump no matter what, actually it's 40 some percent. This is an audience. Trump, Trump didn't create this. He just simply played to an audience that's been created for the last 50 years at least. Um, uh, Pat Buchanan and Kevin Phillips uh, in 1968 went into Nixon and said, we can tell you how to hold on to power and control the South for the next 50, 50 years. He said, how do you do it? He said, we got to play on those who hate the gains of the civil rights movement. We've got to engage in something called positive polarization. We must intentionally divide the country for political power. We must exploit the division. This was in a memo to the president. It said, we must, we, if, and if we split the Democratic Party and split the country, we'll get the better half. And we have to constantly split it. Now, we can't do it with overt racist terms. We can't call people the N-word because that, that worked in 54, but it won't work in 64 and 68. So what we have to do now is start talking in code. And we talk about things like force busting and states' rights. And then we even have to go further and get more abstract and talk about tax cuts and make people think that somebody else's benefit is the reason that they're suffering. And if we do this, they said we can control the large part, the whole South, parts of ethnic conclaves in the North for 50 years. That was 52 years ago. And a lot of money was put behind that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of books were written by that. And think tanks were put behind it. The Koch brothers decided in the 1980s in an article that was printed in the New York Times, they said, we're no longer going to vote for or put forward Messiah candidates. We're going to fund think tanks. We're going to fund uh, organizing. We're going to fund ways of talking about um, uh, suppression that doesn't sound like it's suppression. We're going to put money there, and then we'll create a movement that can punish our friends, uh, enemies, and reward our friends. And we, we'll take any candidate because we'll be able to mold them. So I just want to say to the person who asked this, this is an audience. But, but. Jonathan Shell's book said to us, it is an illusion. And that's the part I don't want us to miss. We keep, for instance, talking about Trump, 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 Trump. Well, Trump didn't get into office by himself. 
62 million people voted for him. 65 million people, however, didn't. He didn't win. He won an election based on the, on the electoral college. And 100 million people stayed home. So what has happened in this culture, too many people have decided to be spectators. We are, we are let, we're allowing people to do stuff to us as though we are only the spectators. And what our movement is saying is we must do more. There's actually more. If you, even those horrific numbers, 140 million poor people, so forth and so on. The flip side of those numbers is, is more power there. A third of the electorate right now is, a 30% of the electorate is poor and low wealth people. Uh, 64 million poor and low wealth, only 29 million voted last time, 34 million. So we're gonna have to change the conversation. And the larger question is not, how do we change the 30% that supported him? Is how do we move the 100 million that set out? <laughs> That's the larger question. And how do you do that? Well, you can't, you gotta either have a movement that will force the politics to deal with where people are and talk about the real issues of facing them. One of the things that we say all the time, Republicans tend to racialize poverty, Democrats tend to run from poverty. We have to deal with the reality of poverty, the reality of racism, a grown up conversation focused on policy agenda item. And what happens is that people will begin to connect their vote and their political activism to their very lives. That's what has to happen. And we cannot overestimate the power of extremism. And we then, then underestimate our own power. We can't make either mistake in this moment. Thank you. Um, I want to kind of smush a bunch of questions together for a very short one to two minute reply so that we can hear from Dr. Ford. Oh, but um, stop talking so much, Liz. You preachers <laughs> are talking too much. It's Liz's fault. She's always talking. I'm short winded. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you had a wish list, like what kind of public health data do you not have that you wish you did? And what kind of work can health equity researchers, scholars be doing and producing um, and prioritizing in their work? So, so I'll jump in and I'm sure Reverend Barbara will, will add, I, we'll both be quick, but um, I mean, I think uh, it's been very important for us to, you know, again, in the words of Reverend Barbara, not just curse the darkness, but to come forward with solutions, with light, um, with possibility, and, and then to be able to have data that says that the public health impact of living wage jobs is this, the public health impact of expanding, you know, healthcare, um, uh, you know, adequate food, you know, strong social programs. I mean, one of the things we've been trying to, to say, and economists have helped us to do this, is that the cost of poverty, the cost of racism, the cost of inequality are greater than the cost of solving it. But, but I think to have more public health data that also um, shows, you know, exactly what Dr. Bassett opened up with which is that, that poverty and racism are public health epidemics. And, and you all have been doing really powerful research along these lines to, to be able to, to continue to see both the public Im health impact of increased racism, increased poverty, you know, ongoing, I mean, this death measurement that Dr. Barber was talking about before, um, and, but then also that it doesn't have to be this way and that public health researchers, um, experts say that yes, investing in healthcare, investing in education, investing in living wage jobs, investing in voting rights, you know, protecting this democracy, um, that this is good public health. The world that we can have, the world that we can have is listen, the world that we can have, we need the data on here's the problem, but here's the possibility. Right now, for instance, I wish we had data on, I hear people saying, you know, that yes, blacks are three, four times more like, like um, likely to die. But I want to also, that says now, is that black folk or is that black poor people? Uh, is it white poor people? Let's, let's break it, let's disaggregate it all the way down, but then flip it over and say, if we did this, this is the world we could have. If we did this, it's like Jeremy Clemere, he's the movie producer, and I'll close real quick, 20 seconds. He was saying to me the other night, every great movie has a turning point. 
Every great movie has a turning point. It has a point in which the movie opens and there are all these problems and then it looks like nothing can happen. And then the hero rises and there's something, it's a significant something that turns to say there's another outcome possible and leads people to that possibility. What could be? That's what we have to hear now, especially now because we cannot go back to normal. This vote on Tuesday cannot be about going back to normal. It must be about restraining evil, a psychic political break from what we're seeing now, only to push forward, only to push forward and not just to stay where we are or go back to where we were. Thank you so much. Um, we are at time for our, our question and answer session. Um, unfortunately, um, we're, we didn't get to answer one of the questions from Facebook, um, but um, please do leave those messages so that we can potentially uh, get back to you and answer those questions. Um, I will now um, introduce Dr. Ford um, to close us out. So Dr. Ford is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences and the founding director of the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health. Um, on to you. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. And I want to thank Dr. Bassett and the FSB Center for inviting me to be involved with this. I also let me share my screen. I do just want to acknowledge that I live and work in Los Angeles and work on lands originally inhabited by and cared for by the government and the people. And certainly we cannot talk about um, racial and uh, social justice without acknowledging that um, we, even we who are affected by uh, racism and other inequalities nevertheless benefit from injustices afforded uh, um, against the indigenous peoples of the Americas. So I just want to say a few words uh, about why I think it's important for researchers to be involved here. As the name suggests, the novel, Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, is new. The evidence to date suggests this virus has never existed in human populations before. In contrast, neither racism nor poverty, nor the struggles to overcome them are new. They are not new in the world and they are not new in this country. There are, however, new tools in the field of public health that enable epidemiologists and other researchers of conscience to document these forms of oppression with great precision, map their spread across the nation, estimate the amount of death and disease they cause, and most importantly, provide evidence that supports the movement to a social and racial justice that communities are waging for themselves. We, social epidemiologists and other scientists of conscience, stand with the Poor People's Campaign in Repairs of the Breach in recognizing as egregious and intolerable the levels of poverty that exist in the United States today, the extraordinary resource gaps between the wealthiest and the poorest people and the rates of death and disease these social injustices produce. There is no conflict of interest when scientists who are trained to be objective stand for justice. A substantial body of evidence links poor health to racism, poverty, and other social determinants of health and what we might think of as societal determinants of health. So the science is clear. These injustices are needless, the health inequities they produce are preventable. As uh, social epidemiologist Nancy Krieger put it, quote, at issue is doing correct science, not politically correct science. If we blot inequity from view, not only will we contribute to making suffering invisible, but our understanding of disease ideology and distribution will be marked, unquote. 
In addition to the research, public health professionals are eager to apply the evidence about racism and other social inequalities to the work they do by treating racism as a public health problem. For the last days, the flagship professional society for the field of public health, the American Public Health Association, has been holding its annual conference virtually. We've been discussing the state of the science in public health research and practice and sharing strategies that promote equity in the U.S. and beyond. Former APHA president, Dr. Kamara Jones, defines health equity as, quote, assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people, unquote. Living in poverty stifles the potential of people to attain optimal health. Living in racism, living with racism, stifles the potential of people to attain optimal health. As expressed during the opening plenary of the conference by Brian Stevenson, the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which advocates for people who have been given the death penalty, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. Our society is at a crossroads. Thousands of studies have examined the relationship linking social injustice and injustices and health. With respect to the, to COVID, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, stark disparities in diagnoses, hospitalizations, and deaths persist, disproportionately burdening indigenous, Asian and Pacific Islanders, Black and Latinx populations, signaling our collective failures as a nation and reminding us of the work we researchers must do to shift the course of this pandemic. We've learned much about the nature of racism and poverty in society. What this period calls for is for work that goes beyond documenting health and social injustices. Thomas's, Thomas and uh, his colleagues have suggested that the first generation of health disparities work documented the disparities. The second focused on explaining the causes of the disparities. The third developed solutions to the disparities. The fourth generation calls for us to use social justice and anti-racism approaches in, in collaboration with our community partners to advance social justice and health equity. It calls for science rooted in justice and equity and a two-way bridge connecting research in the academy with movements in the street. In closing, I return to Brian Stevenson. I return to Brian Stevenson's remarks during that opening plenary this past Sunday by urging epidemiologists and other scientists of conscience to quote, position ourselves in proximity to, unquote, those who are most impacted by poverty racism, and the other social injustices this pandemic is making apparent. Our work is most honorable when it is relevant. The persistence of these disparities serves as an indicator of our collective moral failing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Um, I, w I know we're a little bit over. I just want to thank you guys for all participating and watching um, and engaging with us. And I invite you guys to actually go to uh, hsph.me slash the people's health for more information and links um, that were shared in the chat and other ones that you might want to check out. Um, so thank you so much and have a great evening.